All right, so we are back in the book of Hebrews after being out of Hebrews for a couple of weeks for the um, Palm Sunday and the Passion Week uh, and and Easter Sunday, of course. And we are in Hebrews chapter 11, continuing our chapter and verse study through Hebrews 11, the chapter of the Hall of Faith. And this is going to be the first of a three-part message this morning related to persecution, which I do believe is coming. I believe persecution is imminent against the church and against anyone who's going to speak, speak out against the evils of our culture and speak out uh, for uh, the unborn and, and, and for the traditional family and traditional marriage and traditional genders and, and all of the rest. I think persecution is coming and we need to be prepared for that and not fear it. And so this is the first message uh, in a series on persevering through persecution, and the title of this message is Faith That Suffers Victoriously. Faith That Suffers Victoriously. This is part one in a series, Persevering Through Persecution. Part two will actually be on Wednesday night. I encourage you to come out Wednesday night for part two. Part three will be next Sunday morning. Of course, you can watch online on Wednesday if you're not able to make it out in person uh, Wednesday night here at 6.30 for our midweek service. Faith that suffers victorious, victoriously. Hebrews 11.35 <clears throat> says this. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. I love that. Of whom the world was not worthy. What a great honor that would be to, to be called someone by God, that God says the world wasn't worthy of this man or this woman because of their faith, because they were willing to suffer for me. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And you go right into chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance." The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 of chapter 12. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now, last Wednesday night, we looked at uh, some of the uh, men of faith listed here in verse 32. We looked at the story of Gideon on Wednesday night. Also, Barak. We looked at Samson. We looked at Jephthah. And we looked at David. So I encourage you to go back and listen to last Wednesday night's message. And you could see uh, and hear about those men of God and their faith. And their evidence of, of their faith in uh, s- serving the Lord and stepping out in faith and fighting for the Lord uh, in, in the Old Testament. We didn't get to look at Samuel. So I'm, I want to just mention Samuel here quickly. Because Samuel is also mentioned there uh, in verse 32. Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Now, Samuel was one of those prophets who stood before kings. He stood before King Saul, the first king of Israel, and he, of course, anointed and stood before King David. He also anointed King Saul as the first king uh, of Israel, and then he anointed King David, the shepherd boy who would take Saul's place. <clears throat> and Samuel was, was willing, even though it was unpopular and perhaps dangerous, he was unwilling to speak truth to power. And so we must learn from these men and these women of God that they were not afraid to speak truth to power. Uh, We have to speak the truth in love, but we have to speak the truth 
nonetheless, even if it's unpopular, and it's becoming less and less popular to speak the truth of the Word of God in our culture because we are a godless, a biblically illiterate culture, sadly biblically illiterate, even in most churches. And so we have to remember, let, let God be true and every man a liar. And whatever it is that God commands, that is what we have to stand upon. That is what we have to speak. doesn't matter who we're speaking to. We should be willing to speak truth to power. And Samuel was willing uh, to do just this. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, just quickly turning back there, uh, verses 17 through 19, Samuel tells the king, the king of Israel, which could have been his life. I mean, some of the the prophets were killed by the kings when they spoke the word of God to them. Uh, So they were not necessarily very popular. So Samuel said, 1 Samuel 15, 17, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? He's saying to King Saul. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord or obey the word of God, he's saying? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Of course, Saul gives a real lame excuse there. Uh, And then uh, the hammer kind of falls and the kingdom gets taken uh, from him. But he was... Basically telling him, God commanded you to utterly annihilate the Amalekites. And, and, and what is very interesting about the story of the Amalekites is that we're told if you continue to read the story of King Saul, he was actually killed by an Amalekite. So had he obeyed God, in God's, God was even telling him to do this for his own safety and for his own protection, God knowing the future. And because he disobeyed God because he wanted to make friends with the king and not kill the king, he made a deal with the king to spare his life, Agag, uh, and he wanted to seize the spoil and some of the gold and the treasure and so forth when God told him not to do that. Uh, he ultimately was killed, we're told, in the record by an Amalekite. Uh, and, and also... God said to kill all the Amalekites because God, knowing the future, knew that there would be a time in Persia where there would be a wicked man named Haman in the Persian Empire at the Persian court who had the ear of the king, uh, Artaxerxes. And Haman tried to eradicate and exterminate the Jewish race. And we're told that Haman was a descendant of King Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites. So God, knowing the future, said, wipe these people out. They're going to try, and number one, they're going to kill you. And number two, they're going to try and eradicate the Jewish Jewish people, uh, and, and he did not obey the Lord. And, be, and because he did not obey the Lord, the kingdom was taken from him. Samuel says in verse 22, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, obedience is better than sacrifice and to heed than than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and s- stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And because you've rejected the word of the Lord, God has also rejected you from being king. And the kingdom was ripped away from Saul at that time. And that's when he went and he uh, anointed David the shepherd boy, who would take his place ultimately and eventually as the king uh, of Israel and the man after God's own heart. Now, in the Old Testament... When we look at these uh, pagan nations in the promised land that they were supposed to drive out, symbolically in the New Testament for you and I, it speaks of our old nature, our struggle with the old man, our old nature. You come to Christ, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're born again, and you are supposed to die to your flesh. You're supposed to mortify your flesh. You're supposed to crucify your flesh. You're no longer supposed to make any provision for the flesh, giving into the lusts of the flesh, according to Romans chapter 13. And so we see here, Paul the Apostle would say, make no provision for your flesh. Reckon your old man dead. Paul the Apostle would say, I am crucified with Christ. That is dying to my old self, my old nature, my own old thinking, my old ways, so that I'm no longer brought under the bondage of sin and the slavery to my own fleshly, lustful desires. i got to die to that stuff, and I have to live for Christ. We have to put off the old man, Paul says, and put on the new man, put on Christ. And we have to do this every single day. And so uh, Samuel 
an example of courage and boldness, speaking truth to power. It's better to fear God than man. He wasn't afraid to tell the king these things, although it could have been his life. And, and the key takeaway from this is obedience is better than sacrifice. It doesn't matter how much you serve or how much you give. God cares about obedience, obedience to his word. And, and the more that you learn of his word, the more responsible you and I are to obey his word and Rebellion and disobedience is as witchcraft and insubordination is as idolatry. Very, very important truths there uh, revealed to us uh, with, with the prophet Samuel. So back to Hebrews chapter 11 as we continue to look at this uh, great, the end of this great chapter, Hebrews 11. Picking up in verse 35. <clears throat> Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So all of the other examples up to verse 35 are examples of victories, examples of successes, uh, examples of overcoming great adversity and, and, and in the end winning, as it were, uh, in spite of overwhelming odds and overwhelming challenges and overwhelming enemies. Now it kind of, it, uh, the author of the Hebrews kind of changes the the, the, the tone a little bit and changes the tune here of the chapter and he begins to talk to those who uh, according to our eyes and according to the the record they lose they don't win they end up dying they end up in prison they end up tortured uh, they end up uh, in, in animal skins goat skins uh, and, and sheep skins they're in caves and in dens uh, on, on the run because their lives are at stake. And so it's not the great victories of the rest of the chapter. It's a victory in a different kind of a way, really even a more powerful victory than, than having uh, success in your endeavors for God. This is actually apparently losing in the eyes of man, but God sees you as a winner because he says these were those who were tortured. They were not willing to accept deliverance. In other words, to just give in, to just cave in, to get out of the circumstances by compromising their faith. No, they were willing to suffer victoriously for God. They didn't accept deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now, it's interesting here that the Bible refers to a better resurrection, indicating that there are degrees of blessing and degrees of authority and degrees of position actually in heaven. And the Bible does talk about this in other places. There's also actually degrees of punishment and judgment in hell. This is one of the examples here in the scriptures where we see there are differing degrees of blessing and authority in heaven. For those here who uh, were tortured, they did not accept deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. They weren't focused on the here and now in this life. They were focused on eternal things. Turn back with me to Luke chapter 19. Jesus actually had a lot uh, to say about this, about the degrees of blessing and authority uh, in eternity uh, and the degrees of judgment in eternity based on how we live our lives today. <clears throat> Luke chapter 19 and verse 12, Jesus <clears throat> tells them a parable. This is the parable of the talents, and it's, it's told here in Luke's gospel a little different than uh, the parable that he told of the talents in Matthew's gospel in the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew chapter 24 and 25. But here he talks about not, not talents as money. He talks about uh, or the reward of the faithfulness of the talents being money. But he talks about it actually being government of cities and overseeing government uh, of, of different cities. So we read this in Luke chapter 19 verse 11. Now as they heard these things he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem. And because they thought the kingdom of God would immediately appear. And there's many times where Jesus taught them, the kingdom's not coming yet. There's got to be a lot that's going to happen first. The gospel had to go to the whole world first before the end would come, before the kingdom of Christ would come. Well, guess what? 2,000 years later, the gospel's gone to the whole world already. But it, it wasn't so at that time. They were looking for his kingdom to begin then. But the gospel had to go to the whole world. There was many things that had to be fulfilled. Israel had to be dri driven out of their land and brought back to their land uh, and, 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 and so forth. But he says this in verse 12. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom for himself and to return. So this is a parable about Jesus. He went to a far country. He went to heaven. And, and he's going to receive a kingdom for himself. And he's going to come back and he's going to return to take possession of that kingdom when he comes back for his church and then comes back to uh, set up his thousand-year reign. 
Verse 13, so he called ten of his servants and he delivered to them ten minas. And he said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he may know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And, and the mina was the equivalent of a three-month salary of a Roman soldier. A lot of money. Three-month salary. Roman soldiers are paid pretty well. So in today's economy, they'd probably be paid ninety to $100,000 a year, uh, maybe $300 a day uh, or, or something along those lines. And so you're talking three months of salary. This would have been in the neighborhood of twenty five, maybe twenty twenty five thousand dollars It was a, It was a large amount of money that was entrusted to them. So he says, your mina has earned uh, ten minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you are faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you will also be over five cities. So it's very interesting that in this parable, Jesus is telling his disciples and telling you and I, number one, we're going to be held to account for our time, what we do with our time, for our treasure, which is our money, and how we invest our treasure into the kingdom of God, and for our talents, the gifts and talents that we're all given by God uh, as uh, those who are made in his image. Our time, our treasure, our money, and our talents. We're going to give an account someday for our stewardship over what we did with what we had. And it's a very sobering thought, actually, when you stop and think about that. But he's saying, for those who were faithful with a little, they had one mina, a three-month salary, and one of them increased it ten times. Another one increased it five times. And God says, your reward, when I come back to receive my kingdom and come back to establish it, you're going to be over ten cities, he says, to the one who was faithful that earned ten minas. He says, you're going to be over five cities. So what does this indicate? It indicates that there is going to be governance and authority given to us as his people, different governance, different authority, based on how we were as stewards of our time, our treasure, and our talents when Jesus Christ comes. So there's going to be rule and rulership that we are going to rule and reign with Christ, but it's not going to be equal for everybody. It's going to be what you did with what you have and what you were given. Very interesting and, and very sobering, actually, when you think about it. He says, likewise, there came another, verse 20, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept away hidden in a handkerchief. He, he basically buried it. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming, I might have collected it with interest? So it's very interesting. This one who was a faithless man, who was a wicked man, a wicked servant, he buried his mina, he buried his talent. He didn't use it for God. And he did his own thing. And, and he even misjudged God's character. He, he, he said, you're an austere man. You collect where you did not deposit. You reap where you did not sow. And then God answers him, kind of mocking him. Like, out of your own mouth I will judge you. God's saying, you wicked servant, you know that I'm an austere man? Uh, you know that I collect what I did not deposit? In other words, he's repeating to him, like, how dare you say this to me? Like, I'm unfaithful, or I'm unjust, or I'm unrighteous. He says, why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? He said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he already has ten minas. For I say to you, verse 26, that everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over there, them and slay them before me. So Jesus is coming back as a judge. He's going to judge us based on our stewardship. Not for judgment of punishment, but for rewards. It's the Bema seat of Christ being spoken of here. And he's also going to judge those who were wicked and those who were faithless uh, and those who were 
his enemy. So there are differing rewards for us for our stewardship of our time, our money, our talents. There's also going to be differing degrees of punishment for the wicked. Turn back to Luke chapter 12 where Jesus speaks about this in verse 35. Jesus says, speaking of his second coming again, let your waist be girded, your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will, will return from the wedding that when he opens and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also, church, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect Him. So that is the pre-tribulation rapture. He could come at any time, any minute. His coming is imminent. When He comes for His church, when that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ are raised in the twinkling of an eye, you're not going to have time to get right with God. It could be the first watch, the third watch, the fifth watch, whatever watch it is, the middle of the night, the middle of the day, the morning, the evening, whenever He comes back, it's going to happen instantaneously. And then we're going to be gone or we're going to be left. And so he's saying, be ready because you don't know when the Son of Man is coming. He's coming at an hour when you do. We know the seasons and the times sure looks a lot like what we're living in today, doesn't it? The seasons and the times of his coming. But no one knows the day or the hour. Verse 41, then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? Verse 42, the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant who his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all that he has. And so we're to be looking for the Lord. We're to be serving the Lord. We're to be anticipating his soon return. And we are to be working while it is still day. And God says, you know, just be watching for me. And when I come back, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. We are to occupy until he comes. And that even means being involved in the political systems of this world. As corrupt as they are, we are to be uh, involved uh, in the political systems because we have a vote. And, and our vote matters because these people in Sacramento and in D.C. make the laws and appoint the judges that then judge us that we have to follow the rules or we are punished as law breakers. And it's better to obey God than to obey man. Verse 45, he says, But contrarily, if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him at an hour when he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. These are the false believers, the false Christians, the one who think they're Christians, but they're really not truly born again. Uh, Paul would say they're uh, with us, but they're not of us. And uh, so he's warning. He's saying that uh, the servant that says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. In other words, not looking for the coming of Christ. They're so caught up with the cares and the things of this world, the partying of this world. They're not looking for Christ's return, his imminent return. They're not serving the Lord, not being faithful stewards of their time, their treasure, and their talents. And he says, I'm going to come at an hour when they are not expecting and I'm going to cut him in two and appoint him a portion with the unbelievers. And he says in that servant, verse 47, who knew better, he knew his master's will, but he did not prepare himself to do according to his master's will, shall be beaten with many stripes. People are going to be held accountable for what they know. Jesus said, be careful how you listen. Because we're going to give an account for every word that is spoken to us, especially when we hear the word of God. And whether we respond to it and obey it or whether we reject it and do our own thing. So he says, the one who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his master's will, he shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes 
shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to him whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Very serious from our, the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ to us, to his people, about our stewardship of our time, our treasure, and our talents. But notice that Jesus says, not only are there degrees of authority and blessing in heaven, ruling and reigning with Christ, but there's also degrees of punishment in hell because God is fair. And so God is going to punish Adolf Hitler, let's say, for example, in a far more severe way for all eternity. And Lucifer and Satan and the devil and the, and the fallen angels, the demons, much more severely than he is someone perhaps who dies, who never heard the gospel, who was worshiping a rock or something in another pagan nation that the gospel never reached and they never knew Jesus, they never knew the Lord. God's fair and he's just and he's going to judge everybody fairly and righteously. I don't have any worry about that. No one's going to end up in hell who didn't deserve to be there and no one's going to end up in heaven who didn't deserve to be there either according to the gospel. Uh, and so he says, he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes, he will be beaten with a few. But he who knew better and did not prepare himself a due according to his will, he shall be beaten with many stripes. The takeaway is to him, uh, uh, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. We're all going to give an account either at the Bema Seat of Christ or at the great white throne judgment. I encourage you to make sure you're saved, you're born again, you've repented of your sins, you've turned to Christ and asked Jesus to save you of your sins. Uh, uh, I would encourage you to be water baptized. We need to have a water baptism again and spend about a year and give folks an opportunity to come forward and publicly profess their faith with water baptism or rededicate their lives to Christ publicly uh, and, and just be on fire for the Lord because we are going to give an account someday uh, for uh, our, our stewardship of everything that God has entrusted to us. And that includes our money as well, guys. God asks us to give the first fruits back to him. So we continue uh, back in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 36. Still others, those who suffer victoriously, still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and in caves of the earth. So these are those in the hall of faith who suffered for their faith, who suffered even unto death for their faith. You think of uh, Elijah, the prophet, chased by King Ahab and the wicked Queen Jezebel, uh, running for his life often, hiding in caves, dressed in goat skins. You have Elisha, who came after him. Same thing. Elisha was often on the run from the kings of Israel. You have the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was one of the prophets who was mocked for preaching the word of God and mocked for prophesying. They made fun of him and they mocked him and they did not believe his word. You have the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet who didn't have one human convert in all of his ministry and he was actually thrown into prison. He was put into chains by the king of Judah because he was proclaiming the word of God that, that they had to turn and repent and they actually had to give in to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians who were besieging the city of Jerusalem uh, in 586 BC. The city of Jerusalem fell because they did not heed the words of the prophet Jeremiah and, and they, they dismissed him. They rejected him. They chose to listen to the false prophets who were bringing false prophecies to the kings and to the rulers of Judah and they threw him actually even into the public toilet. They threw him into the pit that was the public latrine, uh, latrine as a humiliation to the prophet Jeremiah, yet he was faithful to continue to preach the word of God to them. Isaiah was the prophet who uh, Jewish history tells us that he was the prophet who was actually sawn in two, who the author to the Hebrews is referencing here where he says that there was one who was uh, sawed in half. And, and the record is that King Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, who was the wickedest king in Judah's history, actually uh, began to kill all the prophets of God and began to worship Baal and Ashtoreth, uh, even in the Holy of Holies in the temple of God, 
uh, and offered his own children as human sacrifices, kind of like California law wants to legalize infanticide, killing of our babies. That's what he was doing. Manasseh was killing his own babies, offering them to Molech and to Baal. And uh, Isaiah was prophesying against him, of course, Isaiah being a very old man at this time. And he actually took Isaiah and he sawed him in two, cut him in half as an example of what would happen. Cut him in half as an example of what would happen to someone who disobeyed the order of the king. And yet Isaiah continued to preach the word of God. These men are going to have a greater resurrection. These who suffer for the Lord are going to have uh, greater blessings even in heaven for all eternity because they were willing to suffer for God. Now Jeremiah tells us, and I love this scripture in Jeremiah chapter 20, Jeremiah 20 and verse 8, we read this. For when I spoke, I cried out and I shouted, violence and plunder, Jeremiah 20, verse 8, because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. He was preaching the word. He was preaching against violence and corruption and plunder. But his word uh, was a reproach and a derision. The people didn't respond and they hated him because he was proclaiming the word of God to them. And he says in verse 9, of Jeremiah 20, then I said, I will not make mention of him, of God, nor speak any more in his name, no longer proclaim his word, he's saying, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. I, I just love that. For I heard many mocking, fear on every side, report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watch for my stumbling, saying, perhaps he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. Not only did he not have any converts, he didn't have anybody that listened to him. He was persecuted. He was hated. He was despised because he was telling them the truth. He was preaching the word of God to a wicked and godless generation. And so he's an example to us, to you and I. And it's like a fire burning within our bones. We cannot but speak the truth of God's word and of the gospel message to this wicked and corrupt and dark generation that we live in. And, and we are in good company. The scriptures are encouraging us to continue to proclaim God's word. Uh, Paul said, woe to me if I preach not the gospel. He had to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, give us a heart like Jeremiah, like it's a fire burning within us. And like Paul the apostle, that we would speak no matter the cost. In Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16, Jeremiah said this about the word of the Lord and God's words. He says, your words were found and I ate them and your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. And may that be true for you and I today as well, that we would feed upon the word of the Lord and it would be a joy to us to feed upon his word to receive his word through the Bible teachings through our own devotional times during the week in our Bible studies uh, where he says your words were found and I ate them we just feed upon it's soul food it's food for our soul our manna from heaven your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart this is why he could not contain it later in Jeremiah chapter 20 it was like a fire burning within his bones and he had to speak forth the word of God God give us a heart like Jeremiah in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 we're told this about the word this is why people hate the word of God wicked and godless people hate the word of God for this reason for the word of God Hebrews 4 12 is alive it's living and it's powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You see, the word of God, when spoken, exposes people's hearts. People often will tell me, Pastor, did somebody tell you about what I was going through because 
you preached on something and it made me pretty uncomfortable because I thought, how does he know what I'm doing in secret? Or how does the pastor know what's going on in my home or in my private life? The answer is no. I don't have spies out there watching everybody, knowing what you, I, quite frankly, it's enough for me to just keep my own self on track. I don't need to worry about all of what you're doing in your private lives. That's between you and God. I give you the word of God and then we all have to go home and live it out. But the reality is, is God's word, it pierces our heart. And that's why people who reject the word of God, they hate the messenger. They want to kill the messenger because it cuts them to the heart. And so our response should be to fall before the Lord, to humble ourselves before God, and to submit to his word, especially if he's speaking to you. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. The Word of God is alive, it's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides even between the soul and the spirit, the bones and the marrow. It reveals and discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God gets right to your heart and to your mind. And then he says in verse 13, there is no creature hidden from his sight. It's all open before God. There's nothing you're doing or thinking that God doesn't know or see. You just have to know that. God sees it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. We're stewards. And the more we know, the more accountable we are. And I'm happy to tell you, you're going to have to give a great account for what you know because you've been taught the Word of God in this church. And I commend you for being in a Bible teaching church because the Word of God is how we grow, how we learn, how we mature, and how we become more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But especially in these last days that we're living in, the Bible predicted and forewarned that the last days are going to get darker and darker, more and more evil uh, before the light of the world. Jesus Christ comes back to set up his kingdom, and that's what we see today. It's, it's going to be especially tough to proclaim the word of God in the last days. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul speaking to the young pastor Timothy uh, right at the very end of Paul's life before he was executed by Emperor Nero. He was beheaded. We're told this, 2 Timothy 3.1, but know this, Paul says, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And perilous times could be translated stressful times, difficult times, really, really hard times, Paul says. Just be prepared. If you're living in the last days, it's going to be tough to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's going to be difficult. Oftentimes, you're going to have to stand alone in your faith and in your place of work and in your home and in your neighborhood and in your culture. And we must be prepared to stand alone because difficult times, perilous times, treacherous times, stressful times are going to come in the last days. And I believe that's what we're seeing today. Then he goes on to define what the last day's generation is going to look like. He says, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud or prideful, blasphemers, using the Lord's name in vain, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. I encourage you, read this later and look at this list and see if this doesn't perfectly align with our culture in America today. Because you could check every one of these boxes and this is exactly what our culture looks like today, which means that we are very likely the generation that is living in the last days. He says in verse 10, but you carefully followed my doctrine, he tells the young pastor Timothy. You have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, Paul says, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And then he tells us this, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Don't be surprised if the world hates you, Jesus said, because it hated me first. And if the world loves you, then you do not have the love of the Father within you, John says. 
Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I want to just share just, I, people send me information all the time. Uh, they text me, they email me, I get videos, I get news articles. I get a lot of really interesting information sent to me. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to share with you just a couple of uh, of, of articles or headlines of articles that recently uh, I have been made aware of or have been sent to me. This was just from April 20, uh, actually I think this was from April 19th, this is from a, a few days ago, um, maybe it was actually April 22nd, 2022. Um, the Fresno Bee, local paper in Fresno, has this, this news article headline, Westminster College is facing backlash from people who say These are not Utah values. It says hardcore porn class offered to students at Utah College, quote, as American as apple pie, unquote. This is just the headline. I didn't even have to read the article. They are teaching hardcore porn classes in colleges all over the nation. But I guess in Utah, the Mormons, Church of Latter-day Saints, they got upset about this because it's kind of like not normal for Utah to have hardcore porn taught to students at a Utah college. And this is the Westminster College in Utah that is facing a backlash because it's not Utah values. But it's the values of our society and our culture today, isn't it? Uh, This is another article, recent article from March 29th, actually 2022, from the Religious News Service. The headline is, with Christian cannabis... A pastor is promoting the spiritual side of marijuana. Craig Gross believes he can convince Christians to give getting high a try. Just a headline. You don't need to read the rest of the article. I read the rest of the article. It's terrible. This guy thinks he's a pastor, a Christian pastor, and he believes he's enlightening people, he's growing marijuana, and he's part of the Christian church service is getting high. Christian cannabis, it says. Next, a Fresno Bee article. This is from a couple of uh, weeks ago. Again, Fresno Bee, it says, Sobriety is marked with numbered chips, much like Alcoholics Anonymous, but given out at 66 days, 6 months, and 666 days. How the Satanic Temple helped this Fresno area woman's recovery from heroin and meth addiction. The Satanic Temple is now helping drug addicts, apparently, and they're celebrating their sobriety on 66 days, at six months, and at 666 days. It's an equivalent or a counter to, of course, Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. This is in our local Fresno paper. Along with Satanism that's on the rise all over our culture, there's this school. This is from January that I received this um, from someone. And it is a sign-up sheet. It's a picture, actually, of a sign-up sheet for a school in the state of Washington. And it is an after-school program put on by the Satanic Temple. And it has a little picture of the devil on it. And this is for elementary school children in the state of Washington. It says, the Satanic Temple. Temple After School Satan Club. You know how we have Christian clubs and Bible clubs? Now the Satanic Temple has Satan clubs at elementary schools. It says, hey kids, let's have fun uh, at After School Satan Club. Science projects, puzzles and games, arts and crafts, projects and nature activities. Parents, your children will learn benevolence and empathy, critical thinking, problem solving, creative expression, and personal sovereignty. After school Satan clubs are taught by volunteer teachers who have passed criminal background checks and have been verified by executive ministry for professionalism, social responsibility, and superior communication skills. The Satanic Satan, sa- the Satanic Temple is a non-theistic religion that views Satan as a mythical figure representing individual freedom. Remember, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law is the first commandment of the Satanic Temple and the Satanic Bible, written by Anton LaVey. It says instead, the Satanic, uh, it says the after school, um, 
After school, Satan Club does not attempt to convert children to any religious theology or ideology. Instead, the Satanic Temple supports children to think for themselves. All after school Satan Clubs are based upon a uniform syllabus that emphasizes a scientific, rationalistic, and non superstitious world view. And it goes on. It's a sign-up sheet for children to sign their children up at this elementary school in Washington to go to this satanic temple after-school club. And so, you know, when I say that there's all of this stuff in our culture and you really can't make this stuff up, I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up. And and it's happening everywhere. Uh, The the, the wickedness and the, um, you know, disregard for the things of God and for traditional morality, biblical morality and so forth. And so we have to be prepared to suffer, guys. It's going to come upon all of us. It's going to come upon all of us if we will take a stand against the wickedness in our culture, in our generation. Uh, We have to be prepared to be persecuted for righteousness' sake, and we will be in very, very good company. As a matter of fact, Jesus warns us in John Chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus says this, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In me you will have peace, but in this world you're going to have tribulation. Why? Because this world is under the power of the evil one. It's under the power of the devil. The devil has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. And, and, and so he's telling us, I've overcome the world, but in this world, expect it. Don't be surprised by it. You're going to have persecution, and you're going to have tribulation. Jesus says in John chapter 17, in his high priestly prayer for you and me and the church, he says this in John 17, verse 14, as he's praying to his Father for us. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Because they, the Christians, the church, they are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, Jesus says. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world, you see. So don't expect that the world's going to love you because the world hated Jesus. The world hated the apostles. The world hated the prophets. The godless, wicked, selfish world hates God. You and I hated God really before we came to Christ. If you remember who you were before you were saved. We didn't want to hear the word of God. We didn't want to hear the gospel. We didn't want to hear about the Ten Commandments or about loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. We just loved ourselves and wanted to do whatever we wanted to do. And so don't judge them. They're in darkness just like you were in darkness and I was in darkness before we were saved, before we came to the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Jesus says this in John 17, 11, again, praying to his father. He says, now I am no longer in the world, but these, the Christians, the church, these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. We are in enemy territory, guys. We're called ambassadors to this world. We are called diplomats. We are called sojourners. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. Our home is in heaven, eternal, uh, established forever uh, in the heavenly places. We read in John chapter 15 and verse 18, Jesus says this, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He says, he who hates me, Jesus says, hates my father also. You can't have the father without having the son. 
You have to come through Jesus Christ to get to heaven and to get to the Father. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Not a popular message in this pluralistic, anything goes, do what you want society and culture that we live in today. In John 16, verse 1, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. He warns them, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Very sober, very serious. Quickly, Matthew chapter 10. We're just about finished here. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. Jesus says this. Behold, speaking to you and I, the church, the Christians, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But be aware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. For you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you shall speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver a brother to death, and father his, a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household, his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. And exactly as Jesus predicted and prophesied happened, didn't it, to his disciples? They were all killed. They were all martyred for him. All of his disciples. Judas Iscariot killed himself. Judas was replaced. Uh, the twelfth apostle, I believe, is Paul the apostle who replaced Judas Iscariot and took his, his place in his office. Uh, all of them were killed for their faith except for John the Beloved. They tried to kill John. They took John and threw him into a cauldron of boiling oil. The boiling oil did not hurt him according to Fox's Book of Martyrs and early church father's writings. And so because they couldn't kill him in a boiling pot of oil, they actually put him on the Isle of Patmos, a, a rocky crag out there in the Aegean Sea uh, where it was a slave labor sort of a thing as an old man. And that's where Jesus appeared to him and showed him the future and gave him the book of Revelation. And so he was not done with his mission yet. John is the only one who lived out his days. All of the rest of the apostles, including Paul, were martyred and killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. And there's so many who have followed them, great men and women of God, who have given the ultimate sacrifice for Jesus and given their lives. They were not willing to deny the Lord. Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you confess me before men, I will confess you. Before my father, it's a matter of fact, let's just read verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, Jesus says him, I will also confess before my father who's in heaven. Verse 33, whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my father who's in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth, but I came to bring a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Indeed, those who die for Christ will receive a better resurrection. So it is such a challenge to us. It is such an encouragement to us that we are not alone as we prepare for what I believe is coming, which is persecution upon the true church. God is going to separate the sheep from the goats, and he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. And oftentimes it's through the fiery trials of persecution that God reveals who are truly his. And so I encourage you uh, to continue to stand for Christ in these last days, in this wicked generation, this dark generation that's getting darker and darker all the time, but praise God that 
One with God is a majority. And even if you have to stand alone, you're never alone because Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Shall we pray? And Father, we do thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you for bringing us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your glorious light through faith in your glorious Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, your precious Holy Spirit, who is our seal, who is our down payment of heaven, Lord, that we are born again by your Spirit, Lord, born from above. We have your Spirit, Lord God, in us, transforming us from the inside out into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your holy word that's inspired by your Spirit. Thank you for your word, which is truth. Help us, Lord God, to continue to live our lives for you, Lord. Continue to take a stand, Lord God, everywhere we go, with every word we say, Lord, that we would be those who are living not for the love of this world and the things of this world, but living for eternity and eternal things, looking forward to heaven, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the author and you are the finisher of our faith. You who started a good work in us will be faithful to complete it until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless your people. Fill us with your spirit today. Empower us, encourage us, strengthen us, protect us from the enemy, Lord, until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.